But you said almost time. It was like two seconds. I noticed that it's wrong. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, church. For those of you who are joining us online today, welcome. We're honored to have you here with us this morning. And uh, please say hello on our social media there and let us know that you're here with us this morning. And we had some really great things. Had a lot of fun yesterday here. Uh, we converted it first into a breakfast tub over here in the morning for the men's breakfast. And we had a really nice men's breakfast there. Had some really good discussions. So that happens the first Saturday of each month at 9 a.m. So watch out for the next one. It's going to be February 4th. We'll be having that breakfast right here. And we'll have all the information and everything ready to go on our website here very shortly. And then last night... We tore everything down, moved it all around, put up the big screen in here, and we had movie night last night. And it was a really, really great movie. We uh, got to see God's Not Dead 4, We the People. And it was very, very relevant to what uh, is going on in our nation today. So it was a great movie, a uh, great opportunity to kind of bring ourselves up to speed on what's going on. Then, coming up here in the next couple of weeks, believe it or not, February 11th, we have the 18th season for Orange Track Racing going on right here. So that has been uh, a fun ministry to have here. And as you can see, if you can see the graphics on here, we have tons of cars and everything. Of course, it was the, the last one. I think uh, this was the season finale, wasn't it? In November, if I'm not mistaken. No? No? I think a couple months before that. Okay. Uh, anyway, we had lots and lots and lots of cars, tables full of cars, and so it was a great time. A lot of new people were here, and uh, just a wonderful ministry to be able to get together, have fun, and have it in a family, fun, safe atmosphere in here. And the neat thing about it is you raise 24 cars for five bucks. You can't go anywhere and do anything. You can't even buy a burger anymore for five bucks. So. It's a great time, February 11th, uh, we start the 18th season right here, Gray Street. So welcome, this is the day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. I love saying that. You know, it, it was kind of neat if you looked out today, you know, you're driving across town. When I came in this morning, the city hadn't been out and done anything and the roads were slick and glazed over. Just the nice glazing that you see all over the trees from the fog and everything. It was beautiful to look at when you're driving and not so much fun to drive on. So I, uh, after I got here and I was here for a while, I went, oh yeah, I forgot to tell Lori that oh, no. E Avenue that. and F Avenue and going up the interstate was just like ice. <laughs> so you slid out onto the interstate. Not a, not a fun thing to do as you're driving. But we're glad that everybody was able to be here today and be with us online, if not here in person. And as we begin our worship today, let's go to God in prayer real quick. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just open our hearts to you this morning. We praise you and thank you for this day, another day in your presence and another day of life. We thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus and the sacrifice that he made to bring us together in presence with you and to restore us unto you dear lord so we just thank you for that opportunity we thank you for the opportunity to come here today and to worship you and to bring praise honor and glory into your name lord we just ask that as we come into this time of worship you uh, prepare our hearts for the message that you gave pastor terry to give this morning and lord put it upon our hearts to do as the message calls us and that is to follow you so we praise you and thank you in all these things in your precious son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the call to worship this morning comes from John 12, 26, uh, that Pastor Terry picked for us this morning. And it says, anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my service must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. And that's a really great great time that when we look into that chapter of John it it talks about our Christian faith the basis for our Christian faith and he tells that Christ's death is the most significant moment in history it allowed God 
the Father through Christ to be revealed in their full glory and to receive the praise and acknowledge what God had done by sending his son, his glory. But beyond that, it shows our purpose that God has for us when we believe and have faith in Jesus. It gives us that basis to be reunited with God by following Christ in faith. And the basic purpose of this historical line that they were talking about here in, in John is to give praise and honor and glory to God for what he had done. But not only that, it transfers over into what has yet to come for us in our lives, what he is doing in our lives. So it's a past, a present, and a future of what God has in store for us and has had for throughout history. And with Christ's death, it spells that we have Satan's ultimate defeat already. He, he had defeated Satan at that point in time. And it is awesome. It showed that no one, not even death, could defeat God and his control of his plan for history for everyone. So it's, it's kind of a neat section in John if you really get in and read the whole section. And that's why Terry and I always say, you know, don't just go by this one verse, but read around it. Read before it, read after it, and get the whole context of what's going on. See, we, we, uh, we seek to that same death in our lives, in that similar vein. It's a self-seeking discipline, a disciple's goal for us. We seek to kill all of our selfish goals. We seek to kill all of those things that would separate us from God. So we put those to death, and the scriptures tell us in there that we need to die to our old selves to be reborn in Christ. And so those who live under the Lordship of Christ have no choice but to follow him obediently. Disciples come under his Lordship voluntarily. We come to Christ. We give a choice. We give ourselves, our life to Christ voluntarily. It's free will. And once we have chosen him as master, we must then obey him and follow him completely. In doing so, then we receive God's direction and we receive God's gifts. And he puts our life on the right path to what he wants our destiny to be. We don't and can't allow ourselves to be subjected to our own decisions. And we need to submit ourselves to God instead and let him direct our lives. So I can't wait because Pastor Terry's got a great message for us that talks about how we need to follow God, how we need to follow through on this plan that God has given us and put upon our hearts to follow Jesus. Let us pray. Lord God, we just uh, ask you to open our ears to hear and open our minds to follow through, open our hearts to receive your message today and to live it out each and every day as we hear more of your word and your promises through Christ. Amen. I already snagged it for you. Nah, I see that. <laughs> Thank you. As I was uh, praying about the message for this week and thinking about it, Follow Me kept coming up over and over and over again. As you saw in the graphics before this, it shows uh, someone walking in the sand, looking like Jesus, and a reminder of the footprints uh, poem. Mm -hmm. But it was more than just that. It was like, what is it? What does it mean when somebody says to follow me? Now, the one thing it doesn't mean, and this is a graphic that isn't in the script that I gave to, to Mark and Diane to, to watch uh, for what I'm going to be talking about, but... Uh, there's a graphic that I'm going to have Diane put up here that shows a bunch of icons. And, and if you recognize these, <laughs> you've been on any kind of social media, you've know, you got Facebook, you got Messenger, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, all these different ones. Some even up here that you probably have no idea what they are. And that's okay. But this is not what it means to follow me. That's why I, I wanted to throw it up this way. It has nothing to do with following me. Now, a lot of people say they want to follow Jesus. But those people are more likely to be following 
uh, the likes of some superstar sports person or uh, some superstar musician or or whatever that is and don't get me wrong there's a lot of people who do follow Jesus but the sad part is is that those people are only following Jesus maybe one or two hours a week the rest of the week is so very different it really needs to become a lifestyle it's something that we do every minute of of every day and even in what feels like our darkest moments, following Jesus. Uh, Diane uh, shared a post from a former co-worker of hers whose son is, uh, has Downs and, and a lot of medical issues. And insurance isn't picking up some of their expenses, or some is an understatement. She's not asking for a handout. She's she went to God about it, and they prayed about it. And little AJ, we've prayed for AJ, and he has made this art where he just makes all these colors on, on these different canvases, and then they're putting a saying or something on top of it, and some of those are scripture. And they're selling those. And it's like, hmm. Then he's like, I um, wonder what color the girls would like for Christmas. <laughs> There's fine. They, they, she went to God, and God said, "Here's a way for you to help meet those bills." Following God, even in the worst of it, it's a lifestyle, not something on the schedule. Today we're going to talk about following Jesus, and when He says, "Follow me," what does that really mean? And this is going to be maybe a different take on "follow me" than any of you have heard before. And I'm okay with that because that challenges us to really dig in more to the scriptures. As Mark pointed out this morning, we need to really take what we're telling you, but go further into it, read further into it. So we're going to start in the book of Matthew. And this is a, uh, just as Jesus is about to call two of his future disciples, Simon, who will become Peter, and Andrew. And this comes from Matthew 4, 18 and 20. It says, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and we've seen pictures of this, and I love the serenity of the Sea of Galilee. But he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew. And they were throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Now, this at its very basic level... Most people read this and go, they just dropped everything and left? Who was going to man that? I'm an, I'm an analytical. I'm sitting here. Who's watching the boats? Um, what's going to happen to the boats? Did they anchor them down? Um, are there fish still in the boat that somebody needs to take care of? Because y'all know what fish smell like. And after they get a little warm... So all those things are running through my mind at first when I read this years and years ago. But there's so much more to it. And Jesus is calling us just like he did Simon and Andrew. And here's the thing. Jesus has not changed any from when he called them to today. So Jesus has not changed, nor will he ever change. In fact, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now that means just today, just as it did then when he says, follow me, he's inviting us also to follow him. And then you can hear it, I, if you're like me, you can hear this from the Old Testament. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. But he keeps saying, follow me. Saying, here I am. Okay, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> Many non-believers and even some believers might be asking the question, follow you where, Lord? Where am I supposed to follow you? Now physically, Simon and Andrew literally followed Jesus. They just 
got up and walked and followed him. But what about us? As he is saying, follow me. It's kind of important to know that destination, don't you think? If you're going to follow someone, you want to know where they are going. For, the, for those of us that work for, uh, still working for a living, we're following our company because that's part of working for them. Where are they going? What are their future plans? What does that look like? Because if you're working for a company that has no vision, they're not going anywhere. They're just existing for a time. And then they end up like some of the companies that we've seen here just recently. Uh, I think there's all of three Kmarts left. We were talking about 16th and Williams, a picture that I saw on Facebook a week or two ago of all the businesses that used to exist in that space back in the 60s. And I saw Giants, which I didn't even know was a thing. I had no idea that Piggly Wiggly was in Iowa. Of course, my grandmother did have that board game. That was fun. Squirrel. Um, there was the Shakies. There was a gas station where the BP is now next to McDonald's. Totally different name. The Holodome was still there. I found out that that domed thing behind it wasn't anything to do with the hotel. It was actually a water tower. <laughs> or is. Things change from then to now, but Jesus has never changed. Where are we going? Some of these companies don't exist. Why don't they exist anymore? They couldn't change their vision. Kmart thought they were changing their vision by buying Sears. That didn't work out so well. But people will blindly follow something or someone in a worldly sense without even thinking about it. If we follow Jesus blindly, that does have eternal consequences. Because when you think about following Jesus blindly, you don't know where you're necessarily going. And maybe you're not doing the things that Jesus called you to do. You might be hearing those things, but you're not following them, or you're not maybe not following them in the spirit in which they were meant. We've all read the scripture. They knocked on the door. This is a paraphrase. They knocked on the door. Jesus says, depart from me. I don't know who you are, but but we, we did miracles in your name. We, we spoke about your your, the many things that you did. I don't know you. They weren't following Jesus in the way that they needed to be following Jesus. If we do not know where or why, we end up not actually following him at all. That's why the scriptures tell us that the highway to hell is very wide. But it's only a stairway to heaven. It's only a narrow path. The gate is narrow. When you commit to following Jesus, you... There's so many words I could throw in here. Need, must, have to be serious about it. Because by following him, you will end up where he is. It answers the question that... that and I steal it from Mark all the time. Life ends eternity where? It answers that question. By following him, we end up where he is. In a marriage, we commit to one another until death do us part. That's a huge, huge commitment. And not everyone takes it to heart. Some people, it's only half of the that that takes it to heart. In my first marriage, I took it to heart. My grand grandmother said she bet she she was all about that marriage death till you depart you you followed that you did it regardless so I went through and I lived through many of her finding out that she was still dating and I kept forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and finally I heard that still small voice said that it's not going to change and let her go. She wanted it, so I did. 
Uh, Diane and I were talking. In August, it will be 25 years that she's put up with me. <laughs> Blink of an eye. Blink of an eye. Mark and Lori, you have a, a big anniversary coming up this summer in July. Blink of an eye. And before we know it, we're walking around going, oh, my back hurts. <laughs> and, we're, and we've become, we've grown old together, but it's so wonderful. It, it, it's like we know where we're going and we're doing it together. And it feels right. And we've made a decision to go in the same direction. So where is it that Jesus is asking you to follow him? And when he says, follow me, do you know where he's asking you to go? Well, Fortunately for us, there's a book in the Bible that tells us that. And it's this is going to be a different take on Luke 15 than you may have heard before. So in this chapter, we have three parables. The first being the lost sheep, the second being the lost coin, and the third, the prodigal son. They all go together, even though they don't, even though the first two really seem like they do, and the third one not so much they really do the truth that Jesus teaches us in this chapter is extremely important it's the <coughs> only time bless you in the Gospels that he uses three parables to talk about one truth Jesus really 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 wants us to get this truth so let's dig into this let's start with the parable of the lost sheep so verse 1 tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. This gives us the prelude into why Jesus gives us these three parables. Then in verse 3 it says, So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me! I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have it straight away. Then we have the parable of the lost coin, starting in verse 8. It says, or, or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until he finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. These two parables are then followed by the parable of the prodigal son. We have one father, two sons. One son wants his inheritance now. And in, in that day and age, he is in essence saying, Dad, you are dead to me. Give me my money now. I'm done with you and I'm done with the family. Bye-bye. After getting it, what does he do? He does what so many others do when they come into a ton of money. I was taking my dad home from the men's breakfast yesterday. We drove by the gas station. I see the sign in the window that Mega Millions was, and I couldn't see the period. So I thought it said $11 million. I was so wrong. It's at $1.1 billion. So many people, the people that win these things end up worse off than when they started because they don't have the tools to handle that, to handle that influx. So what does son do? He takes it, he goes off to another country and he spends it on what? Himself and so many simple things. We're not going to get into those today. We can do that in another sermon or we can go back to a 2018 sermon that Pastor Mark did on the prodigal son. 
And if you want that one, I'll find it and I'll send it to you. Just let me know. But here's the thing. When he runs out of money and he has nothing left and he is doing anything and everything he can to try and make some money, even wishing he was able to eat the slop that they were feeding the pigs, he came to his senses and humbly he went back to his father. He heads home and he hopes at the very, very best he could be maybe a slave or a peasant. Not a part of the family, but a part of the workers. Can you imagine his surprise that he's, he's coming and still a long ways off. His father sees him, recognizes him at a great distance. And what does his dad do? He doesn't walk up to meet him. He runs. And he greets him and he hugs him and he restores him. Now we can't forget the other son. The one who stayed with the father working the entire time. Because he fits into this story as well. He gets jealous. And he is furious that his father would treat his brother who treated the family like they didn't even exist anymore. How could he treat him so well after what he had done? Well, let's look at each of these three parables. What are the, some of the things that they have in common? Now, one of the things they have in common is wrong place. Sheep's in the wrong place. The coin's in the wrong place. The sun's in the wrong place. Then we have the things that are in the right place. We have the 99 sheep. We have the other nine coins. And we have the son who stayed and continued to work for his father. In the parable of the lost sheep, God is represented by the shepherd. In the lost coin, we have the woman. And in the parable of the prodigal son, we have the father. So in the first parable, what's in the wrong place? We already talked about that, that one sheep. The right place was the 99 others. How, can you imagine? I mean, I think of what things looked like then, and certainly there aren't any buildings, and there's no houses out there. I mean, it's just this big expanse. And we've read where, you know, the shepherds have to fight off the wild animals to keep them from eating their sheep. Yet he leaves the 99. He says, be right back. And he goes and he finds the other one. He carries it back, and he's so excited. Because he knew the 99 were going to be okay. And the woman with the coin. Those nine coins. When they're, how many of you have lost something in your house and, and go looking for it? We've gotten to this point where we remind, and Diane reminds me more of it than I remind her. When we're looking for something, did you ask God where you put it? Because heaven, he, God already knows it's in the last place that you put the thing that you're looking for. Why don't you remember? Well, go to God and ask about it. And in this final one, as we're talking about the two sons, I just physically, the one son was in the wrong place and the other was in the right place. Physically. But at the end of this parable, it's the attitudes that change. So they, they're in a different place. So the prodigal son comes back and he's now in a right attitude and he's restored by his father and he understands what he did wrong. But the other son has switched and is like, he's a man. But what's the focus? As a representative of God, what is the focus of the shepherd, the woman, and the father? The focus is what was the so we have the sheep, the coin, and the sun. Now, most of us, when we lose something and we can't find it, what do we do? Eh, well, at least I still have this. Or I still have that. And we, we just don't worry about it. But like the shepherd, Jesus goes after the one. And when we're called to follow him, 
Now you start to get an idea of what that destination is. And like the woman, Jesus' focus is finding the one. And like the father, the focus is on the lost son. That is where Jesus is going. Jesus is saying, follow me to find the lost sheep, to find the lost coin, or to find that lost son or daughter. Now, now you know the destination. It's to seek the lost. It's to find the lost. It's not about, like that graphic I showed you earlier, following somebody on Facebook or whatever other social media it is. It's not about uh, showing up, following Jesus to church on Sunday and Bible study on whatever day of the week that is. It's not about that. Although those things are a part of it, it's not all of it. Now, about 20 years ago, when I was um, still uh, when I was a youth pastor, I, I was introduced to an organization called Young Life. Young Life has morphed and changed over the years, but at that time, um, I, I really appreciated the mission that it was to go to where the kids were and to build personal relationships with them. And by building that personal relationship, then they were able to share Christ with them. That was the whole thing. Well, at that time, I met the executive director, and we became friends. And her name is Tiffany Lloyd. Tiffany has not been a part of Young Life for years. Because, well, her and her husband got a call. Not on the phone, but by God. Her and her husband were called overseas. They currently reside in Kathmandu, Nepal. Now, how many of you can imagine moving halfway across the world to Kathmandu with your spouse? Now tag into the fact that over the years they have had children and they are now at eight. Now, if I, if I remember correctly, the oldest son is back in the States. Raising eight children and growing your marriage in a foreign country, basically third world. None of the comforts that we have here. Here's how God is using them. This is how they have followed Jesus. This is from their, uh, their Christmas newsletter. And Tiffany shared this story about her husband. And it's interesting how she has to word things. So the word gospel, to make it Back here is spelled G O five P three L to scramble the words so that gospel doesn't show up on any filter. So it says that Stephen has been able to share the gospel with co-workers since being back in the office and has been invited to weddings and meals with co-workers that have opened doors to gospel conversations. Earlier this week, a guy shared with Stephen that a while back, Stephen had done something in the office that impacted a group of peers and prompted them to consider Stephen's honesty and integrity compared to their own. Something he had done, not something he said, something The men concluded that they were too flexible. Stephen has been encouraged by God, both giving new opportunities, as well as revealing ways that Stephen is making an impact where the Lord has him. Now on top of that, they own a cafe that she manages and runs. And the landlord just opened up new space for them and they're knocking down a wall and they're going to create a space for four young girls to live so that she can disciple them. And she's discipling people through the cafe and through the workers that work for her. And all of this is done in a way that you don't get caught. See, we can come here freely. We can put a big sign on the front of the building that says Grace Street 
Well, we actually have it say Grace Street Dot Church because that's our web address. But we have that sign up there. We have a sign out in the street. It just says we are a church. They just have the name of the cafe. It's the things they do and the things they say, both for her in the cafe and and Stephen at the cafe, but it's also Stephen at work. Now, granted, this isn't necessarily where you're going to wind up. You may not be called to overseas ministry. There's plenty of ministry to do right here. But when we respond to Jesus, things will begin to happen. Mark and I could stand up here and testify all day long to the things that have happened to ourselves and our families because we are accepted God's call to plant Grace Street Church. And the trials and the tribulations that we go through with our health and so many other things. But God is good. Things will happen when we finally step into our true calling in following Jesus. So all of us have a calling, a different calling, to do something different in different places, but the basis of our calling is all the same. It's all to, always to follow Jesus. And these are the things that can happen when we get serious about following him, and these are the things that scare some people off of following him. In the movie we watched last night, and, and her name escapes me, but she was from Iran. And they had moved to the States and she had accepted Jesus in one of the earlier movies and her father had kicked her out. Fairly violently, he picked her up and he hauled her out. And he kind of set her down outside the door, not real gently, and slammed the door in her face. That is not as unusual as you might think. People shun family members all the time because they start to truly follow Jesus. See, the, the thing that happens when we follow Jesus is that it's like a news flash that people get. And they find out they are not the center of the universe. The world doesn't revolve around you. Just like the sun doesn't revolve. Jesus is heading to find that lost sheep, that lost coin, that lost son or daughter. He's inviting us along on that journey. And, and I can almost see him standing there, looking over his shoulder, saying, follow me. Follow me. Follow me to seek and save the lost, not just to go to church. Because you know what church is? This is our place to get re-energized and to learn and to prepare to follow him. And when you do, you're taking steps in a direction that you've got no idea what's going to happen. Now I'm going to jump back uh, to one of the two that we were talking about a little earlier. We were talking about uh, Simon and Andrew. We're just going to call Simon Peter for right now because that's how most of us know him. Peter, we know he followed Jesus and we know he did it well. That is until Jesus was arrested and he was taken to the high priest's courtyard. Do you remember what happened next? We go to Matthew 26, 58. It says, meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance. Remember this word, distance. And he came to the high priest's courtyard and he went in and he sat with the guards and waited to see how it would all end. So he just kind of went in. I'm going to take a back seat to this. Just kind of watch what happens. But he's a follower of Jesus. So what does happen? As a follower of Jesus, as he's sitting in that courtyard, is he following Jesus or is he focusing on himself? For this, the stakes for Jesus have just gone up exponentially because he's, you know, we're going to see beatings, we're, he's going to be crucified, we have all this coming. It wasn't just about Jesus anymore. Following 
me meant it was also about Peter's own safety and his own security and all those things were at risk. And what happens when things become at risk for us? If you're a little kid, you hide under the covers or you crawl under your bed. I can't make it under the bed anymore, but I can get under the covers. Um, but Peter was physically putting distance between himself as he's following. Because he's following a distance. So you got to imagine they're quite a ways ahead of him. It's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if you watch procedurals on TV, like some of the crime shows, you, if you're tailing somebody, you follow at a distance. You don't want to be caught. You don't want to be seen. So he's hiding. He's still following Jesus. But because he's putting distance both physically and spiritually between himself and Jesus, this is what happens. So we go to Matthew 26, uh, verses 69 through 75. And 69 says, Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came over to him and said, You were one of those with Jesus, the Galilean. Instead of saying, yes, I was one of those with Jesus. No. Verse 70 says, but Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And here he had an opportunity to say, yep, you are absolutely correct. I am that guy. But instead, again, Peter denied it. And this time with an oath. I don't even know the man, he said. And a little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, You must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore, Curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. Flashback. Verse 75 finishes this passage. I said, suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. He hadn't planned it. But all of a sudden, Peter's destination started to change. And it became more about saving his own life than following Jesus. The greater the distance that we have when we are following Jesus, the more our focus will be on ourselves and not the lost. You see how that, that comes into play? That greater the distance. But the closer we are to following Jesus, the more our focus will be on the lost and not on ourselves. I get I get praise God that. Just like the prodigal son, Peter went back to following Jesus. And in John 21, we read how Jesus fully restored Peter. Peter would go on to preach mightily for the kingdom of many. And the book of Acts, oh, more than 3,000 that first day. So many, because of Peter, would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior through him through the likes of many different people of faith, whether they are pastors or Bible study leaders or just people in the workplace or people, your friends and your neighbors. So many people have come to know Jesus because of that. It doesn't matter if it's 3,000 on that first day for Peter or the millions because of uh, Reverend Dr. Billy Graham or the one. about earlier they went after one sheep one coin one son in our call to worship this morning pastor mark read from john 20, 12 26 where it says anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where i am and the father will honor anyone who serves me so many of the jews believed that jesus had come just for them they couldn't have been further from the truth they were his chosen to take the message out to all people. Jesus, in reality, came for all of us. His message 
a call to follow him is not just for one person or a group of people, but for everyone. And when we take up Jesus calling for us to follow him, we cannot let any of the social, any of the racial, or any of the other issues of the day get in the way. We cannot let those differences become barriers. We cannot let those differences put distance between us and Jesus. And if you are truly ready to take up your cross and follow Jesus, remember his words to his disciples. And this comes from Matthew 16, 24 and 26. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your own soul? Some of you have already responded to Jesus' call to follow him. If you haven't responded, how will you? Thank you, Father, that you give us every opportunity to follow you and that you give us a book that tells us how to do just that that we can follow you, that we can return to you, and you will restore us. When we return to you, heaven rejoices. It is our prayer that as a ministry, Father, that we reach people and that we plant that seed. And through the Holy Spirit, that seed is watered and nurtured and eventually harvested. And another son or daughter comes home to you. In Jesus' name. Mr. Terry, as we prepare our minds and our hearts for our time of communion this morning, I want you to think about that verse in Matthew when it talks about that we have to take up our cross in order to follow him. And when we take our communion, we are called to remember the time when Jesus took up his cross and was placed upon the cross for us. And so he's inviting us. He says, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross to follow me. You must die to your old self to be a part of me. And so as we come into the time of community today where we're celebrating exactly what Jesus did, he took up his cross. He took on our sins. He gave us eternal life and salvation through that act on the cross, through that act of eternal love on the cross. So as we come into that time today, we want to remember that time when Jesus sacrificed himself. And on the night that he was betrayed and he was given up, Jesus had a meal with the disciples and he took the bread and he blessed it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Later on in the meal, Christ took the cup and he filled it and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood. This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And as the scriptures go on to tell us that each time that we get together, we are to take of this bread and drink of this cup in remembrance of him until he comes back to be with us again. And hopefully that will be soon. And with all the indications it might be. Um, but as we come through our time of, of communion today, be reminded that this is the symbol of your cross to take up. This is your part with Christ that we remember his sacrifice for us. We take our communion through intention by breaking off a piece of the bread and dipping it in the, in the cup. Come.
everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's been a couple weeks since we've been here, so I hope you all had a great Christmas and a happy new year, and we're just blessed to be back. So um, last week, we got a few things to pray for. Last week, I had a, um, my niece had a baby boy, so nice. I'm very, very thankful for him and her, and they were very healthy, and so that's a great, great news. And then uh, Sarah and Anton called and said they both have COVID and their oh. children have colds too. So we've been praying for them. Oh dear. Yeah. So we're gonna pray for them. Is there anyone else who would like prayer this morning? Just pray for HB. He's still Carol, he's still not feeling well. Yeah. Okay. He's still feeling well. Okay. Uh, Tim's friend Kim mm -hmm. that has cancer. I yeah. talked to I left yesterday. She is too weak to even have a feeding. As we come together this morning to worship you, O oh God, in your house and online, we want to honor you in all things and praise your holy name. For as in Isaiah 44, 24, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. You alone, Father God, Heal our diseases, comfort us when we are sick or in pain, guide us through the darkest nights. You are our God and so worthy to be praised. We lift up Kim to you this morning, Father God. She is in desperate need of your care. As, as you walk her into your presence, Lord Jesus, I pray that you are with her family and her friends and just guide them and comfort them through this trial in her life. And we honor you for Kim's life. Thank you, Jesus. And today we honor your, you and thank you for all that you do for us. And we praise your holy name, Jesus, God and the Holy Spirit. Today we would lift up Steve, Larry, Mark, Carol, Anton and Sarah and their children. And all of those who online are in need of, in need of prayer for illness or pain. Lord, you are their maker. You formed each one of them. You gave them life and breath. You know their minds and their bodies. You have carried them from, since, they, since their birth. You know each one and their problems. You know their thoughts and you know their innermost being. It says in Isaiah 46, 4, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. We take you at your word, O oh God, and we trust and believe you will do what you say. We thank you for their lives and give you all the honor and glory for their healing. In Psalms 103, 1, 3, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgive all your sins heal all your diseases. Today we also want to praise you for new life brought into this world on January 4th. My great nephew James Robert Ramsey, we thank you and praise you for his life and for keeping him and his mom Brittany healthy. You are a great God and so worthy of praise. I pray God that you will bring their family, this family to you, and they will praise you as their life moves on. Father God, we just thank you today for life and breath, and we want to give you all the glory for all that you do for us. We do not deserve your blessings, but we thank you for them. Please continue to heal our, heal our sicknesses and diseases and pain, and help us to be better stewards of the gifts that you have given us to further your kingdom. In Jesus' holy name, we thank you and honor you today. As always, thank you so much, Denise. As we prepare to end this portion of our service, for those of you that are watching online, we thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we hope that at some point you can join us here in person. Let us end now with this prayer. Father, we thank you so very much for showing us 
your original version of what following you is and what it means. And we pray that in this time that so many are focused on their individual selves and, and the selfishness that is so pervasive, we pray that our hearts would change and that our following of you would not get infected by the spirit of the world, but that we would follow you and be filled by your Holy Spirit. We pray that we will be the ones that follow you to find the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Father, we pray that we will not just run to safety or jump in a lifeboat per se and row away from the scene of a disaster, but that we will be those who will run towards those who are lost. That we would not stop until every lost sheep is found, every lost coin is found, every lost son or daughter is found and welcomed back and gathered into your mighty hands. Father, forgive us when we stumble and fall and, and fail. Forgive us when we have created our own version of Christianity and lived it. But Father, help us to recommit to you and to that original version of what it means to follow you, which is to seek and save that which is lost. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.